Now here's what happens when you have smart ventilation. This is a year's worth of data and you can look on our website online because this happens to be my house. We set the, the threshold for VOC and CO2s at 850 parts per million. And you can look over four years of data as well as the data that's uh, happening right now and, uh, and just see how active ventilation keeps us below this threshold. Every now and then there's exceptional times. Uh, party, kids come home uh, with grandkids and things like that where then there's a lot of ventilation going on. These green bars are showing active fresh air ventilation. And again, this is a year's worth of data, so it's pretty compacted. Uh, you can look at the details yourself. Let's look a little closer at a home in Vermont. This home with smart ventilation has very complex pollution generation, cooking, maybe cleaning and other things. These green bars are showing over this uh, roughly three week period when fresh air is actively being brought in. It is being brought in for other reasons on uh, at other periods of time too, uh, based on the weather and climate. If you spend 10 minutes a day managing or looking at a meter and then decide you need to bump up your ventilation or lower it to try to save energy, um, just 10 minutes of human time a day being paid, say roughly $50,000 a year, that's $1,500 worth of your time. That's basically a number of vacation days that you spent having to be busy, just trying to see uh, and then actively managing. Automatic controls let you manage this. This particular homeowner kept their threshold at about 1,000 ppm, and both CO2 and VOCs, VOCs are the orange and CO2 is the pink or magenta, were tripping it to go into fresh air mode uh, quite regularly. This is a comfortable home, and this actually happens to be one of these manufactured homes. Uh, again, these are very, very comfortable homes, very, very energy efficient homes. And even in this uh, winter dry Vermont climate, the indoor humidity stays at a reasonably comfortable level. And those of you in winter climates where uh, you don't have this control often see, say, less than 20% indoor humidity, a level that is uncomfortable as far as dry skin and nosebleeds and things like that. I won't go into details of this, but here's 10 modes with a smart ventilator from recirculation to venting to free uh, venting to being off to recirculating. And throughout the year from April through March, so there's a year's worth of data averaging the amount of time it's spent in these modes, you can see that it's doing different things based on the owner uh, preferences on their settings, as well as, for example, over here in the spring, a lot of time spent venting because it was actually nicer outside than inside. But then going into the winter where this nice free venting wasn't occurring so much and a fair amount of time spent in the off, uh, in the off mode. The recirculation, as I mentioned, and this is a, a plot that just shows from our simulation results. As you seal up a house and getting down to this level of normal air exchange, which would be like a 0.6 uh, passive house uh, at 50 Pascal blower door setting, with just 40 CFM moving through a house, but no time spent in recirculation, particulates are getting out of hand. With no ventilation, they're out of sight. And again, these are indoor generated particulates are the dominant ones. But here with recirculation, at a rate that's, uh, that's not excessive, say uh, about 100, 100 CFM of recirculation, and then 40 CFM of fresh air build on top of that, that we can lower this to significantly lower levels than what we'd see without that recirculation. And this is uh, extremely important. Here's an interesting plot that uh, if we think of today's ASHRAE ventilation standards, about 20 CFM per person needed to keep air uh, at about 1,000 ppm of CO2 that's about a ton of air per day. And anybody that's shoveled about a ton of stuff knows 
that's quite a bit of stuff. Now, because of buoyancy, it's not quite like shoveling a ton of gravel or cement. It's more like moving a barge load along the Erie Canal, but still, we need about uh, two tons of air inside of our buildings per person to keep us at a good, healthy level. Well, during the springtime in this house with the free venting, you can see how uh, as much as five to six tons of air was brought into the house. This is a single to one to two people occupancy. And then as it shifted into winter, the uh, ventilation system was more stingy on the fresh air, but still meeting the fresh air settings that, that the owner um, had set on their smart ventilation system. Now, a curious thing about that is when we look at CO2 and VOCs, and VOCs on this are the blue bars for each month of the year, and CO2 are the orange, you can see that CO2 is quite low, and even though we're bringing in all of this fresh air into this home, VOCs are quite high. The reason is that nature produces a lot of VOCs, and of course in Vermont you have nice woods with uh, with terpenes and isoprenes and those other fine smelling uh, VOCs that, that make us feel good and in fact may actually be healthy. But, um, uh, but VOCs go up for a different reason than what we typically think of within a home. I just wanted to point out a couple other homes. These are two new homes, just to give you an idea how your ability to select good materials really impacts uh, the indoor pollutants from the get-go in a home. So this is a home that came online last June, built in New Jersey, excellent home, a lot of conscientious thought put into material selection. And from the time it was turned on, this house doesn't exhibit new car smell. This house uh, has nice CO2 VOC levels, periodic venting here and there as it uh, would turn on um, for fresh air, but you can see that it was staying below the threshold that the uh, owners had set for it. Let's compare that to another house that was built in Idaho, but where there wasn't as much active effort put into no VOC paints, no VOC duct sealants, no VOC off-gassing of furnishings. While CO2 levels are very low, this home required almost continuous fresh air ventilation because of these very high VOC levels. And this came online about May of last year. And finally, around, uh, around October, November, VOCs started acting and intermingling with CO2. And so your design choices very much impact the pollutant levels in the home and trying to, from the very start, um, having low VOCs is important. Just to, to take a look at whether or not smart ventilation actually can keep CO2 and VOCs, as well as particulates, um, even though we're not measuring those currently. This is a plot of the set point of a smart ventilator versus what's measured and in CO2 and VOCs. And this line, if we go past this line, it's indicating that it's not being kept at the threshold. And our studies in non-smart ventilated homes has lots of data over on this side. These 34 homes, uh, on average, over uh, this January to May period, and this period was selected because it's primarily winter, where it's dominated by the home being closed up, that you can see, except for two points where VOCs were, were above the threshold, and this one homeowner that was keeping their set point at 600, 600 parts per million requires twice as much air as 800 parts per million. Um, and 800 parts per million requires twice as much air as 1,200 parts per million. So this would be about 40 CFM per person level, the level I keep my house at, this is about 80 parts per million, or 80 CFM per person occupancy in the home. And so you can see over this range of set points, including this one, that smart ventilation can very definitely actively manage the air quality. 
Another interesting thing in this era of high performance homes, all electric homes with, uh, with indoor combustion, uh, gas cooking and gas appliances, uh, uh, CO2 will often dominate, but also at much, much higher levels of both VOCs and CO2 when there's gas combustion in a home. These are all electric homes and VOCs tend to dominate because when we're around this level, this is indicating that VOCs are basically human generated along with the CO2 that the humans put out and over here are our other activities. So when we get data points like these, we urge the homeowners to look at what they're doing. Are they gluing model airplanes together? Are they vaping or just other things that are causing such a high level of VOCs relative to their CO2 output and then ways that they might improve it. But there are reasons why those might be higher and not ones that should be alarming to, to people. Finally, to uh, think about where we're going. And in smart ventilation, our view is that the future is going to offer us some even better rewards as we continue to implement this. Instead of just thinking of a ventilator, some fans that are simply bringing fresh air in and exhausting stale air, but thinking of uh, as we collect this data, and for sure we want to be protective of the data and uh, this era of, and today's discussions surrounding data that's collected in so many things, how we keep that safe, how we keep uh, uh, that protected. But the benefits of that, as we mix the type of things that a smart ventilator with say environmental reports mixed in with biometrics of exercise activity, the food we eat, the, the other things going on, and then finally, this era of big data and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the ability to correlate things that are difficult for us as humans to see that there's a relevance to. Um, what does this mean? Our hope and our thought is that we are going to be able to see trends for each of us individually based on our data as well as the overall uh, community gathered data that can maybe tell us that if we change in this manner, we might be able to avoid a sinus attack or an asthma attack or a migraine headache or a bout of depression. And if we do this, that, or the other thing, we change our diet a bit, the amount of light we get, the amount of exercise or activity, uh, that we might start seeing ways that the amount of fresh air we're getting and the other things as they impact us, how we can keep ourselves healthier and feeling better and how we can minimize those times when we're not. That's where we're going. That's our goal is to overall help us feel better. And our thought is that this is what we call pre-ventilation that we can pre-ventilate when we see that there might be something coming up to avoid and that we can prevent ventilation. That is, we can overall help us just avoid these bouts of time periods that keep us from getting sick. And this is not futuristic. This is happening right now. We are actively implementing things like this. And if you continue following us, we have some very exciting announcements that will be coming up. And this day and age of over-the-air upgrading, these smart ventilation systems, these don't go out of date. They get the new algorithms and new features and new capabilities every time we, we determine that. So uh, before long, you are going to be asking about your indoor air quality. And then you'll just be asking uh, if the sensors aren't taking over, but for some reason you know you'd like it to ventilate, just simply asking for more ventilation or more changes in comfort. So in summary, we're important. Humans are important. It's the reason we design comfortable homes and healthy homes. And it's that human value is much greater than the cost of energy. In cold hard cash, at least a hundred times, a uh, hundred dollars of human value for every dollar of energy it takes to achieve that level of productivity. 
And so uh, we want to see beyond energy that we start putting the value of the human first. Active indoor air quality, it's going to help us improve our health and lower costs. I feel we really will uh, reverse the trends of these so-called Western diseases that are afflicting us, these uh, chronic diseases, these things that develop over time, and that as we continue to assess and analyze the data that we're collecting, we're going to collectively and individually help improve our state of well-being. And then we're firm believers that these sustainable technologies, that these allow us to do things more efficiently and that we can do more with fewer resources for more people throughout the world without sacrificing quality of life. And so, so uh, we're big promoters that we can do more with less and it's not going to mean a sacrifice, but instead just a much better world overall. So thank you very much for your time and participation. Please feel free to contact me directly anytime for any questions or any information on res references. Um, again, I uh, have a list of references at the end of this talk, and these have been selected as ones that I think are good lead-ins for a variety of topics you may be interested in. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to, to try and answer them. Hey, yeah, thanks, Ty. Um, I do see some some questions rolling in, and I uh, definitely want you all to think of some more questions and put them in. And as those questions are coming in, before we wrap up, we just want to say a huge thanks to uh, all of our members, our sponsors, our board of directors, our volunteers, all of you for joining us to make this happen, and to our speakers, of course. Big thanks to our uh, sponsors, uh, Rheem Electric, uh, On Demand, Water Heater, Shrinergy, uh, on the go or in your house battery, T Stud, uh, CERV, Build Equinox, Smart Ventilation, Geo Comfort, Mitsubishi Electric um, Heating and Cooling, and Panasonic Ventilation. Thanks to all of them. Thanks to you. And yeah, Ty, one of the two questions I've got already here that came in that I kind of want to merge together was one was very specific on what was that sensor that you used on the flight. Um, and what what do you think highly, or what sensors do you think highly of? And then kind of merging that into the next question was really, you know, handheld meters for measuring uh, VOCs. What what do you recommend? On the CO2 sensor, um, I can't quite remember uh, um, where we purchased that. It might have been from Onset Computers. Um, those of you familiar with like Hobo data loggers. But um, that's nominally, I think, about a five six hundred dollar handheld that we found has held calibration nicely compared to then the very expensive, more um, say NIST level or uh, laboratory level sensor. What we use within uh, our ventilation system, as far as CO two, then um, is a small infrared sensor that's self calibrating. And uh, now we've got eight years of cumulative experience with that. And we're finding that while they're not, say, laboratory quality, uh, you know, calibration level where they'll hold, say, within 10 ppm over a period of time, they're certainly holding within 100 ppm um, in, in very uh, wide ranges of climate climatic conditions, high humidity, high heat very cold temperatures, low humidity, and everything in between. But it's something we continue to monitor and follow. And because uh, uh, in our case with the CERV community, um, with all the folks who are online, we're able to continuously diagnose and watch these. And we're very pleased with the level of performance. And this sensor is actually the same engine that, um, sensor engine that that Honeywell uses in their CO2 and now VOC stat. On the VOC side, uh, these sensors are called total VOC sensors, the one that we use and the one that you'll find in various, um, now you can buy $100, $150 air quality sensors that are often online. Um, the sensors in those basically have a small element that 
a platinum element, heating element, that heats up and disassociates or reacts anything that's reactive, which is the nature of a volatile organic compound. So carbon dioxide is relatively inert, almost like, uh, like argon or neon. It, as it moves through the sensor, you don't get a reading. As something like methane or carbon monoxide or other reactive type substances, formaldehyde, go through, they generate a signal as they dissociate and create a small electrical impulse. So those sensors have been correlated, typically to um, calibrated and correlated to the human's VOC output. And so on the uh, data that I showed, where it was the same scale as CO2, the actual VOC reading was in the parts per billion, and uh, and then it's correlated to the human's VOC output uh, relative to their CO2 output. And so when the VOC reading looks like the CO2 reading, that means the VOC output is similar to what a human would be putting out. But it could be from totally different chemicals, cleansers or cosmetics or off-gassing from furnishings. Um, you have to be careful when you look at some of the simple sensors online for monitoring. Some will show that they're monitoring CO2, but they're actually using that VOC sensor. And that VOC sense, that VOC sensing technology, uh, while it's newer than the infrared uh, CO2 sensing technology, it uh, has, uh, it's a less expensive technology. It's a less expensive sensor than what's needed for a good high quality stable CO2 sensor. Um, so anyway, if you have more specific questions on that, though, I'd be glad to answer that as far as what we're doing as well as other sensors that, that we've looked at. Um, and let me just add on particulates. We've been assessing and looking at uh, low cost, uh, ones that would be economical, but durable and accurate for including in our ventilation system. And we haven't found that yet. Uh, it takes an instrument that costs about $10,000 to reliably and repeatedly be able to measure uh, particulates, especially in different particulate size ranges like 2.5 micron and 10 micron. And we haven't found that yet. Um, they're getting there. Uh, for example, Honeywell has one that's reasonably nice, but the sensitivity and resolution is uh, restricted to somewhere around, say, 50 to 100 micrograms of particulates per cubic meter. And we need good resolution uh, down to, say, the 5 to 10 microgram per cubic meter uh, for, say, active home monitoring. At the same time, we know that what we do for managing particulates with recirculation and proper filtering that we are keeping those at a very low level. So Thanks, I hope Ty. somehow that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, th definitely. Thank you. And, and certainly we can do some more follow up if there's more questions. Um, so a couple other questions coming in, um, and I'm going to kind of merge these two together. But I think part of the answer, in my opinion, is um, recommending to everybody to go out and check out uh, on our website. Uh, why are new IAQ metrics uh, needed in regards to these two questions? Um, but specifically, the questions are, you know, hey, you know, I'm I'm used to the uh, the the ASHRAE 62.2 uh, as a way to sort of measure success, um, and so now it seems like you're suggesting something more. And then somebody else had a more specific standard they referenced that I've never heard of, um, asking how does the building airflow standard play into the idea of a safe indoor environment, or is it just referencing odors? And, and so I guess just tying those two together, Ty, like yeah. what is the way we should be, um, you know, measuring uh, indoor air quality success in your opinion? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I want to look up that building airflow standard as well. I'm not familiar or, or maybe am, but not sure if uh, we're thinking the same thing, but if, uh, if, if that person could send us uh, a reference that I could look up, I'm interested in that. But yeah, yeah so 
as far as ASHRAE stands, they've been all over the map in the 1970s as we went through the first surge of uh, energy efficiency in 1970s. Was, that was when I was in graduate school working on solar energy, uh, heating and cooling uh, technologies for homes and, and uh, businesses that we dropped ventilation standards to about five CFM per person. And then we quickly found out, hey, your house is gonna stink and nobody's gonna to wanna to be in it if you drop down to five and 10. So there's always been this debate going on. Around 1900, the standard, the recommended standard was about 40 CFM. And that was because as Florence Nightingale knew in the 1850s that uh, uh, the more fresh air, the less likely you are to get sick, less likely you are to get typhoid fever or to get polio or meningitis or any of these uh, diseases that spread so rapidly through airborne means. And then uh, as vaccines and antibiotics came in in the, in the 20th century, we started reducing that as we didn't have as much of a fear of contracting these various ailments. And, uh, and it settled in at around 20 CFM. Uh, this was from 1930s work at Harvard on um, what level would be acceptable as far as odor. And, uh, and it remained at about that. Uh, that was a level at which 20% of the people sniffing air coming through a room with a recently showered person wearing clean clothes was sitting and when 20% of the people would say that's not satisfactory air, uh, that was considered good enough that the other 80% were at least not complaining about that. And that carried through the decades up until about the 70s where we tried going lower again, and then it came back up to about uh, to where it is now. And while it gets somewhat clouded in these tables and that is still basically about uh, 20 CFM per person. We're very definitely recommending 40, um, a study by Harvard and uh, both on the energy impact and on the cognition performance impact. Um, it looks to us that when people are occupying, you want that level of air or more if the human activity level is one that's generating that much more CO2 and VOCs. And when people aren't there, crank it back down. There's no need for, for that level of fresh air, but keep recirculating, keep getting particulates out and keep unifying the air quality throughout the building. And so uh, on top of that, and you'll see a news article, a newsletter article in the past year uh, where we talk about the issue of increasing carbon dioxide in the climate that we are going to be surpassing 600 parts per million. When I was born in 1952, we were at 300 parts per million CO2. Now we're at 400. It's going to go up above 500 and 600. And what that means in our buildings is that the ventilation level is going to go up in order to keep CO2 levels and its impairment of our cognition uh, reasonable, uh, trying to keep our indoor levels below 800 parts per million we're going to have to double again in the next uh, 30, 40, 50 years. There's no avoiding it, the, our ventilation levels. And when we're designing buildings that we hope last 100 years, we need to put in ventilation systems that have the capability of hitting 80 CFM per person. And you can read more details on that, as I mentioned in a newsletter article. You know, Ty, that reminds me of um, one thing you had mentioned where you found that uh, the, uh, the ventilation systems were actually bringing in VOCs from the outdoors. And it reminds me of a particular lead credit where it discusses about um, filtering the outdoor air in containment areas. Uh, I assume that's just fancy term for areas with higher pollution or urban areas uh, or areas that are located next to urban areas. So what um, ways can smart ventilation um, actually filter the outdoor air as well uh, to keep people um, safe from bringing in pollutants when they're trying to bring in fresh air? Yeah, that's a, a, a very good question because we actually see this, uh, for example, in the Northeast in New England where there's a lot of wood burning stoves 
whether it's a self-imposed, uh, just depending on which way the wind blows, taking uh, the exhaust from someone's wood burning stove back around to their fresh air inlet, even though they may be on opposite sides of the house or an upwind neighbor that's burning a lot of wood. Um, typically your house indoor air quality can't be better than outdoor as far as carbon dioxide and uh, uh, particulates you can filter out, VOCs, which um, the sensor we use is very sensitive to those VOCs emitted from like combustion sources. So we do see VOCs from wood smoke, presumably creosote or things of that nature coming back in. The things you can do about that when it's a, um, a chemical as opposed to a particulate, uh, activated uh, carbon filters, um, uh, on top of that, that have the ability to do some absorption. But of course, if you're immersed continuously in that, it's going to take uh, quite a bit of filters. And filters are expensive. Um, the filter cost, if someone's properly maintaining filters, is typically much more than the energy costs associated with, uh, with ventilators. Um, and um, so there's that side of things uh, as far as the external pollutants that are, you know, things we want to reduce in any case for our own health when we're outside. But that brings up as far as like uh, pine forest smell, the things that a lot of us associate with a nice smell. There's some complex issues at play here. The human mind, when we're in a positive frame of mind, is very, very potent at healing us, at making us feel good. When we're in a positive frame of mind, uh, when we're sick, if we can be in a positive frame of mind, uh, we create substances like oxytocin, which has been demonstrated to help us heal faster. And um, it's not always easy to get in that positive frame of mind, but if we can, uh, and certain things can trigger it. I, and this is why placebo effects in so many medications often look as good as the medication itself. And in fact, a number of uh, doctors feel that maybe the medication is just trying to put us in a positive frame of mind long enough for our body to figure out what's going on and, and get us back in tune. But there's VOCs that are health healthy. Um, inhalers, these are VOCs, these are chemicals uh, that relieve respiratory uh, sensitivities. And, um, uh, but there's other substances that are also beneficial. But here's where kind of the contrast comes in. Suppose you're somebody that likes aromatherapy or burning incense. So as we talk about particulates being bad, but at the same time, because of whatever meditation you might be doing, it puts you in a positive frame of mind. So you have these two contrasting effects, or uh, we've heard lately about baby powder and possibly being, or being carcinogenic. But for a lot of us walking into a room and smelling, you know, that baby powder smell or an infant, similarly puts us in that positive frame of mind and, and uh, or smelling um, Mr. Clean or something like that, that clean smell, which is a VOC, but, but puts us in a frame of mind that, oh, this is a clean, sanitized place. So I'm feeling better about being in this room. So we have a lot of these things to sort through. Um, but smart ventilation, as we get more sensors that can then parse apart the various VOCs, and then as we get better at understanding the various interactions of different VOCs uh, and pollutants, that uh, we're going to be able to incorporate those algorithms and sensors and then take it to that next level of management. But right now, uh, and from our view, we, we're just missing fresh air that we need to be having. We need to be uh, we need to be ensuring that we're getting a lot of fresh air in our buildings when we're in there, and then not so much when we're not there. And sorry about that digression. No, that's great. Um, 
Some other specific questions on uh, affordable CO2 detector controllers that could switch on a um, HRV or a rain should. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with anything like that? Yes, um, Honeywell has some uh, very nice stats. Uh, I'm not sure what the name is in it yet, but indoor air quality stats. Um, they have a nice CO2 one and a nice VOC one. The VOC one uses the same sensing engine that, that we use. Um, and we, um, I was involved in a project up at the University of Illinois uh, where my department, mechanical engineering, is getting ready for a building remodeling project. And uh, myself and a couple others are pushing for fresh air being delivered to everyone's office and to avoid a, installing a large duct system in a building that was never ducted. And uh, there's a lot of capital costs that are saved uh, by not having this huge duct as well as health costs. It's ridiculous. And, buildings being designed where somebody way over on the other side of the building that's sick has to make me sick over in my part of the building when there's beautiful fresh air just on the other side of that wall. And so we did a demonstration project where we had a small uh, office size uh, fresh air ventilator that was then linked into um, a Honeywell uh, VOC and then a Honeywell CO2. I think those were about $300 stats. Um, you could set the level of CO2 and equivalent VOC level on that based on your own preferences. And, um, and that worked very nice. Thanks, Ty. And then um, last question here on this end. Um, I just wanted you to clarify you were saying the um, all electric and, of course, uh, tightly built building uh, homes that you were talking about in a particular study, were you saying that more of those VOCs were generated more from from lifestyle choices uh, outside of the the normal building envelope components or con construction components? Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, and and you had also asked earlier on our metrics, which uh, for folks interested, they can find uh, from your site that previous one on the new metrics, mm -hmm. um, the analytics, and, and on our website you can see the analytics for for my house, but. Um, um, as far as. Uh, the generation of pollutants. Let's say that you're in a stainless steel container and it's just a human in there. With the VOC sensor and VOC output of that human correlated to their CO2 output, you would have a ratio of, say, VOCs to CO2 of one. And in the analytics on our website, you'll see uh, something that shows that ratio of uh, VOCs to CO2. Now, it turns out that if it is just simply a human in there, an average human, whatever an average human is, they don't exist, but uh, it's like average weather. It'll turn out that the ratio of VOC to CO2 on that correlated basis is actually less than one. And the reason for that is that VOCs are reactive substances. And if the human is the only source of VOC pollutants along with the CO2, the VOCs will start breaking down, typically into water and carbon dioxide. They also get absorbed into things where carbon dioxide isn't absorbed that much into the various substances that surround us. The VOCs get absorbed in the paints and wallboards and wood and other things like that. They also get re-emitted at other times. But there's other pathways that they disappear rather than just being diluted with fresh air. Now, as we start cooking and cleaning and doing other things that generate VOCs, buying things that are emitting VOCs, we start seeing that ratio go above one. And from, uh, from the um, field studies we've done, as well as all of our fresh air ventilation online measurements, it looks like that ratio of VOCs to CO2 in active homes is around 1.2 or so. And as that ratio gets above 1.5, that's indicating that 
you know, maybe they're doing something that they should try to figure out what that is, like gluing together model airplanes without venting that more directly or, or something of that nature. As you add gas cooking, for example, which would be the most direct form of, um, say, gas combustion pollution in a home, the, if you're boiling water, um, uh, CO2 will be the predominant exhaust from the gas cooking. Very few VOCs, but there's some. There's incomplete combustion of that, so there's uh, various hydrocarbon substances along with carbon monoxide. But the proportion of those relative to the CO2 given off is low, but overall the pollutant loading on the home is very, very elevated. One burner on a stove uh, stovetop is about six people, uh, about a 5,000 BTU per hour burner. That's about um, six, um, the respiratory exhaust of six people. And, um, but now you start cooking Cajun or you burn something or you're just cooking something very odorous. And as lovely as that odor may be, and for example, in also in a recent newsletter article, chicken noodle soup, there really is something to that. And there's a, a VOC that puts you in a positive frame of mind, plus really does have some respiratory healing characteristics to it. That uh, VOCs can start dominating over CO2. So in gas homes, it gets to be a mixed bag, but our field results in conventional homes with gas cooking, which is about half the cooking at this point, um, we tend to see CO2 as the dominant pollute in those homes and uh, versus all electric homes where it tends to be uh, VOCs. Tim, I uh, just unmuted you if you wanted to ask that question. It was, it was fairly large, so I thought maybe you could ask it. Oh, sure. Yeah, so you can hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Okay, then. okay, great. Um, I was just curious um, when we're talking about recirculation in your system, Ty. And we we can get deeper into this. I sent you a follow up message, but sure. Uh -huh. I'm, just from a paradigm uh, uh, point of view, to me, kitchen, bathroom, laundry, those are all exhaust only spaces typically. So when you're talking about recirculating, mm -hmm. I'm curious how that works. And when you're talking about the system conditioning space, heating and cooling. We also have that dilemma that a bathroom, for instance, would be a heated room, so it has a supply. And if yeah. we're tying together space conditioning and ventilation, it should yeah. really only be an exhaust space. And I'm sure you've got that figured out. I, I just uh, want to understand how that works. Yeah, it, yeah. thank you for the question. Excellent question and, and good to hear from you. Uh, I enjoy seeing uh, your, your projects as you uh, are designing some beautiful homes. The, let's take the bathroom first. Uh, our view, first of all, is that every room in a house should be very high air quality. So it's not like you're walking from one polluted room to another polluted room. So the bathroom as well as the kitchen and anywhere else in a home should not be a polluted home. But, but for sure there's these concentrated regions of pollution generation that occur, but they don't tend to be a very significant part of the time. Now in the bathroom, as you, as you described, um, we often are seeing supplies uh, supplying heating or cooling to a bathroom, and uh, our design preference is that bathrooms do not have supply vents in them, uh, that they only have an exhaust or a return vent. And the reason for that is, um, and, and this is where it's somewhat uh, confusing as far as the, the ventilation standards where they say you can't recirculate. I guarantee you, as soon as you turn on a supply vent in a bathroom, you've just blown all that bathroom air into the adjacent room, and so you've just recirculated it to another room. But on top of that, when you have an air conditioning duct, say, going into a bathroom, the inside of that duct in that, uh, especially if that's a metal or like steel diffuser, that's going to be full of rust because that cold diffuser surface is always going to have moisture on it, just like uh, a window in the bathroom becomes a good moisture condenser. And it's going to uh, be a, a source of poor indoor air quality for a number of reasons, as well as not very pleasing to look at. So um, 
Now, uh, venting the bathroom when it needs to be vented. So in our case with a smart ventilator, uh, there's a couple of ways that that goes into ventilation mode. Uh, we have a switch that somebody flips on, like flipping on a switch for, uh, for an exhaust ventilator. But instead, this is a battery-free wireless switch that trips a message to uh, to our serve unit and says, go into fresh air mode. And so it's in ventilation mode for whatever time period the, uh, the, the occupant has set for that vent period. And the fans boost up to a higher level so it meets local uh, exhaust vent um, uh, code, codes on that. And, uh, and then after that time, uh, it can go off. Uh, in addition, there'll be, uh, there, there's uh, what we call an active circuit sensor, which uh, is attached to a light switch. It's hidden inside the electrical box, but it similarly just chirps a wireless message over to the serve to tell it, hey, the light's on in the bathroom. That means someone must be here, go into bathroom vent mode. Uh, now, similarly over in the kitchen, instead of waiting for sensors to pick up on cooking odors, uh, it's very important that, um, that a range hood is pulling odors away from the cook who is at ground zero for cooking particulates. And in our case, uh, again, either a battery-free wireless switch is pressed that puts the kitchen into vent mode, uh, in our case, the fans increase to whatever setting speed somebody has designated for, for that region ventilation, or an active circuit sensor that's connected to, in many cases, um, the homes we're in are, it's a recirculating kitchen hood, a grease screen and a filter to get the cooking particulates out. And then our vents are nearby to then pick that up and then to exhaust the air out. But again, the main purpose, get it away from the cook, uh, knock out the initial grease and that stuff, and then, um, and then return back to our ventilation unit to be exhausted. Uh, and so, so that's how we manage and go into those local exhaust modes. And then there's various dampers in that that can get added. But now going back to the bathroom, uh, the moisture in the bathroom, especially um, as I remember, I think, Tim, you're up in Minnesota, you know, with the dry winters, you want to preserve moisture in the house. And that moisture in the bathroom is actually that's clinging on the walls that's uh, uh, of the shower or in the bathtub, where most of that moisture is hanging out. That's actually good water to distribute. It's not like the moisture that came out of my lungs and if I happen to have a cold or, or I'm sick is getting distributed. And so it's having recirculation uh, when the air quality is being satisfied that uh, it makes sense to keep that inside and not having to replace that. Uh, there's a good energy benefit with that. Um, but we, we now, uh, having uh, more than eight years of field experience in running these systems, um, we absolutely see that uh, this ventilation strategy that, uh, that we've built into our algorithms, it works, and that these rooms are, these homes are being kept odor free, uh, the bathrooms are, and kitchens are being kept uh, mold free, um, mildew free, and in the case of um, of my own personal experience, for example, uh, the laundry room my wife likes to use as a drying closet. She takes a lot of her clothes out and hangs those up. And there's not one sign of any moisture difficulty after eight years in there. And, uh, and then in the kitchen, I'm very fortunate to have a spouse who enjoys cooking and is just a wonderful cook. So I tell people it's like eating in a gourmet restaurant every day. Um, lots of different styles of cooking going on and you just do not see it. You don't smell yesterday's meal for the next week. When you get the odors out, as soon as they're being generated, they don't have time to get infused deeply into your furnishings and materials. Um, and, uh, and you just keep your house smelling much better. Um, so I hope that kind of answered it, but but yeah, we think some differences need to be put into 
today's ventilation standards. With ASHRAE ventilation standards, it really says nothing about how you distribute air in a home. You can just, you know, blow it into a closet and then take it from some other closet. And this is the problem we find in conventional homes is that where the leaks are and where people live are two different things. And so we find that more than half of the leaky homes that we've monitored for air quality, that the air quality is very poor on both VOC and CO2 basis. All right, Ty, well, thanks. Uh, that brings us to the end of our session. So I, uh, Ty, definitely appreciate your time um, educating us on all of this. And we're definitely excited to be having you back hopefully maybe sometime this summer or fall on some uh, new topics related to indoor air quality. And thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.